Bon, bah, maybe we can try to start. <laughs> Sorry for these technical, classical problems. So uh, today I would like to make a presentation on the concept of biodiversity. Uh, it will be an ecological view of biodiversity. What is biodiversity? What does it mean exactly? What is behind? And so it's uh, basic principles. No? And of course, you can ask questions at any moment. So first, so the starting point is the official definition of the of biodiversity. This definition was given during the Rio conference uh, 30 years ago. And maybe the key word in this definition is the word variability. For me, biodiversity is a variability of living organisms. The questions are, where does this variability come? What are the consequences on, the, on life? And of course, what are the consequences for humankind? Uh, as you probably know, this concept of biodiversity was not really launched by scientists, by, but it was launched uh, during the Rio conference by NGOs uh, mainly. So the question is, what is variability? What, what is the mechanisms? What are the mechanisms of this variability? And what is the meaning, the consequences for, uh, for many? Very often when we speak of biodiversity, we speak of species. And we look at the number of species. In this table, uh, you have the number of species we know today in different groups with an evaluation of the level of uh, security of the numbers. Of course, these numbers are probably very bad for very small organisms. And they are better for bigger organisms. And the total number now is 1.8 million species that are none. Uh, what does it mean? It means there is a name. There is a specimen of this species somewhere in a museum. But generally, we don't know where is this species in the ecosystem, what is the rule, what is the, uh, the status, finally, of this species in the ecosystem. So in fact, more or less, we know rather nothing about biodiversity, in fact. Hmm? Ah, because the number uh, is linked to the identification of a species. And sometimes for one species, we have different names, different authors, and so on. Okay, so we have to, to make a permanent revision of the, uh, of the names. So to what I would like to, to see with you is how, why have we this number of species? We could have one species or 10. We have 1.8 uh, million, probably 10 million species in fact. Why and how we can reach this number of species? What are the mechanisms? leading to this high number of species. So if we look at the history of the Earth, we can have this type of figure. Here you have the evolution of the number of marine families during the geological time. And you see uh, a big variation of this number of families with some periods where the number decreases. This is what we call the crisis of biodiversity. In fact, in the history of, of the Earth, 
we know around 60, 60 uh, crises of biodiversity, and we had five major crises of biodiversity. And the, the bigger one was at the end of the Permian period. Uh, at this moment, probably, we have lost between uh, 80 and 90 percent of all the species on the Earth. But this, uh, this loss uh, took between one and four million years. Okay? So you have to keep in mind this scale, this time scale. We are speaking of one to four million years for this major biodiversity crisis. What is also interesting is that after each crisis, you see that the process of speciation starts again. Okay? I have a question. Yeah. What was the reason for that? Two minutes. <laughs> if you look at, this, uh, at the terrestrial organisms, uh, it's very clear. You see a sort of uh, exponential of the differentiation of the species. And this figure gives the feeling that the speciation is an endless process. We can have more and more species over time. And it is not finished, probably. And once more, you see that after each decrease, we start again following more or less the same shape of the curve. Okay. So why? To understand what happens, I will take uh, an example. We took two existing birds, small birds, nut hatch birds, and these two birds live in two conditions. One condition is the two birds arrive in different countries, in different areas. And in the other condition, the two birds live together. So we are going to look at their food, what type of food they eat. And we are going to see that through the size of the food they eat. Okay? So if you look at the following picture. On the uh, x-axis, you have the size of the prey eaten by the birds, and you have the frequency of the different prey on the y-axis. Uh, the different prey, uh, the frequency of the different <coughs> prey they eat, okay? The first drawing is the case with the two birds living in different areas. And we see that they eat more or less the same size of prey. And there is a part of their food that is common to the two species. So we have a risk of competition between these two species. But this is only a risk because the two birds live in different areas. Okay. The second drawing shows what is the situation in terms of the size of prey that are eaten by the two birds when the two birds uh, are in the same area, when they are together. And you see that in this case, the type of food they eat has a change. One species is able to eat big prey, and the other species is able to eat small prey. So their food, their, their food regime has changed, okay? And you see that in this case, the risk of competition is quite low because they have changed their food regime, okay? Is that clear? Okay. So of course, at, the, at this moment, we can reverse the situation. If you separate these two birds in different areas, probably they will come back to the previous uh, food regime. Okay? 
So why do they change their regime? To understand that, we have to, to look at the, the fate of the energy the animal uh, consumes. Uh, when you are an animal or a plant, you have to, uh, to find the resources, the resources you need. Okay? Uh, so there is a cost for the acquisition of the resource. You have to, uh, to grow. You have to renew your cells and so on. You have to invest in defense with spine, uh, spike, etc. You have to, of course, invest in reproduction, etc., etc. And of course, if you put a lot of energy in growth, for example, you cannot put a lot of energy in maintenance or in defense. It is not possi possible because you have a, a limited amount of energy. So we have a basic principle in ecology that is the principle of trade-off. If you are, if you invest a lot from one side, you cannot invest a lot on the other side. So there is a choice. So you can have a lot of very different uh, shame of allocation of energy. You can put more there, or there, or elsewhere, etc. Okay, is that clear? So finally, uh, there is an infinite number of possible allocation. And in a sense, the different species we have on Earth are some different allocation types. Okay? And if we wonder what is a good allocation uh, shame, I don't know. In fact, there are many good allocation types. All the species are existing. They are existing with different allocation uh, types. So there is not a good adaptation, a good chain, an other wrong, a bad, excuse me. They are all good allocation chain since the species are existing after a long time, the time of evolution, okay? So now, if you take into account the time of evolution, the long term, of course, what is very important is investment in reproduction because uh, this is a mechanism by which the species is able to maintain over time. Okay. And with this question of trade-off, if you invest, for example, a lot in reproduction, in, a, not operation, in growth, for example, you cannot invest a lot in reproduction. So finally, the number of individuals of this species is going to decline, and so you are going to disappear, more or less, rapidly. So, of course, the investment in reproduction is a key point for the long-term maintenance of the species. When you're talking about the investment in these different categories, is it at the species level or at the individual level? Like, you're talking about the long-term uh, species? Species level. Species level. Uh, of course, it can depend also of the environment. Yes. <coughs> this is a question of adaptation. Adaptation is linked to internal constraint and also to the situation in the environment, physical environment, bi but also biological environment. But we will see that uh, after. So, another question. I, I don't really, like, if I understood the answer of her question correctly, it's like not about the individual level, it's about the species level? <coughs> or is it like... Of course, it is at the level. No, but like this is like the individual, like the, like the individual can either grow or can do... No, no, no. Or reproduce it's itself. It's within one species. But if you talk about growth of a species... Growth, what yes. What does it mean? More individuals? No, 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 no. Not growth of the size of the, of the population. Growth in terms of the, the weight, for example. Okay, so it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... Uh, Wait, excuse me. There is an ambiguity on the term growth. It is not the growth of the population, uh, it is the growth of the, of the body. Mm -hmm. And I thought that in a Darwinist perspective, there is no choice. I don't know, there is no choice. Of course. You said there is a choice of a No, no, no. 
No choice, of course. But you can understand easily that if you don't invest a lot in reproduction, your descendants, uh, so there is only a, a small amount of descendants, and progressively, you go to the extinction. Okay? So you can imagine that we have a sort of um, minimum investment in reproduction if uh, the organism is able to maintain on the long term. Okay? Alors, a very simple example, uh, example of the um, <coughs> concept of trade-off for a production, for example. You, you take these two birds, we look at the uh, reproduction effort no? in terms of the number of eggs or the number of young birds uh, leaving the nest. Okay? And we took in, we, on the other axis, we look at the, but the growth but the survival of the organisms. And we, cl we see clearly, and we have many examples of that, a negative relationship between the effort in reproduction and the survival. If you produce a lot of eggs, there is a cost for the individual. And in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, I don't know what I'm <laughs> and in this case, well, you decrease the growth, uh, and in this case, the survival. So you cannot be very efficient in all the uh, components uh, of the allocation uh, chain once more. So this is an exact example, an example, very simple, yes, of this. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I was, I'm just wondering uh, about the language in you know, because you're using the words investment and then trade-off, and I wondering like how did that happen and whether um, yeah whether it's like uh, ecology uh, adjusted for economic students or uh, whether this is really like the vocabulary well, we use I understand probably it's not the investment it's the part of the energy allocated to that yeah. and that is that better for you? Or? No, no, it's, it's just about like, uh, the, the language used in ecology is similar to the one... Yes, for a part. Uh, it is well known. There is some concept in common uh, with economy. That's true. Okay. And historically, for example, the biology of population has something to see with the, uh, the question of... Um, uh, I don't remember the name of the guy. Uh, but clearly, there are, there are some common uh, concepts. Comment? Gors. Non, non, pas Gors. Uh, le gars qui a travaillé sur les uh, sur les tailles justement de population humaine. Uh. Mais Malthus. Oui, Malthus, mais le Malthusianisme. Hein, for us, these words like trade-off and investment, they mean an active decision in economics, which is not the case here, right? Oh, it is not the case, of course. It is true the natural selection process. If there is a change in an organism, and if this change gives an advantage in terms of competition and so on, this advantage means you can allocate more energy to reproduction, so your population is going to increase, and more or less, you will replace the other organisms. Uh, voilà. so, 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 of course, it is just uh, a random process. And after that, this random change is selected or not by nature. That means, what, what does it mean, selected? That means that you have an advantage in terms of the intensity of reproduction, in terms of survival, in terms of the production, the number of descendants you produce. Okay. Oui. Um, I just wanted to ask, so who is making the decision to be more productive? Is it just human activity involved in this process? That we see? Uh, it is just, uh, once more, a random change that is selected by a... Uh, so just yeah. Well, pure, ah oui, absolutely. Yeah. 
Well, well, we will come back after. <laughs> Alors, so, finally, if you, have in, if you have in competition, you have two, two birds in competition. We have, seen, we have seen two birds potentially in competition. If they are in competition, they have to allocate a part of their energy to competition. So they have less energy to allocate to reproduction. Okay? So of course, I in the evolutionary time, the investment, the allocation of energy to reproduction is a key point for the long-term fate, finally, of the species. So this is the reason why, when you have competition, if an organism is able to decrease the intensity of competition, it will be able to invest more in reproduction. And finally, what does it mean? It means that, once more, at the scale of the evolutionary time, the, res the response of the organisms to, to competition is to decrease the intensity of competition. And how to decrease the intensity of competition in changing my behavior, for example, the size of the prey I eat normally. If I eat all the prey, I am in competition with another bird. If I become a specialist, a specialist of big prey, I have less competition with the others. So competition with other species. Exactly. And if I have less competition, I have more energy to invest in reproduction. So I will be a winner in the long term. On long term. OK? That's a key point. Huh? The best answer to competition is to decrease the intensity of competition. And if you apply this principle on the long term of evolution, you are able, in fact, to create new species. There is a famous example of the birds on the Galapagos island seen by Darwin. I, I show you that. So what is the story? The story was created by Darwin and was confirmed now by studies in molecular biology. So we are able to, to see the phylogeny of this species, this, uh, species of finch. So the, histori the story is very simple. Three million years ago, one finch arrived on the Ga Galapagos Island. At the beginning, there was no problem. There was one bird, a lot of resources. After that, the number of birds of this species of finch increased. And so we could have the beginning of competition for resources. And so some birds began to change their behavior. Oh, they didn't change. In a vo uh, it was not a volunteer, huh? of course. It was a selection process. Some uh, began to eat bigger seeds, other small seeds. Some uh, are able to stay on the soil. Other are specialists of the trees and so on. And after three million years, you arrive to four 14 different species of finch. They are all specialists of a type of seed, of a type of habitat. And so in this case, they reduce the intensity in the comp of competition uh, between the different individuals. Okay? And if you maintain this process of, uh, as we, we say in ecology, of, it is a concept of ecological niche, in fact. They have changed their ecological niche, the food dimension of the ecological niche. D'accord? Is it clear? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah? So, and in this case, of course, it is absolutely impossible to come back to the former situation. That means the initial bird. Okay? Now we have a change in ge genetic information. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to relate it also to like the human species. Mm -hmm. So if we were to say, I mean, we've been on this planet for very long. So if there are different specialist species, 
within the birds, what would you say would be <laughs> the different segmentations of human species? I'm just curious because maybe there are and we haven't really looked at it and we don't know what our roles are. <laughs> oh, that's, it's a very difficult question. Uh, what I put it. I think that the evolution of humanity is, is exactly the, re the opposite yeah. uh, process. In the history of humanity, maybe the different culture in different continents, different population more or less isolated, was an expression of that. Finally, we have one, uh, one, one or two or three, we don't exactly know, but probably one ancestor. We were in the these uh, uh, people went in different countries, in different conditions, and they evolved finally in terms of adaptation. Uh, the color was, was not the same because, uh, uh, because of the sun. Uh, some were only uh, plant consumers, or other consumed animals, and so on. And now we have the reverse process. We are mixing the different communities, the different populations. We go toward the unique way, finally, of living on the Earth. And maybe it could be a very big problem for the future, because as we are going to see after, I believe, but it is just a belief, it is not a scientific point of view, I believe that diversity is the key for the ability to respond to environmental change, to change in the constraints or in the other, other resources. So maybe, in fact, Humanity has a big problem because we have a reduction of, of diversity. That's possible. This is what I believe, but once more, this is what I believe. This is not, uh, <laughs> this is not scientific. Okay. So, uh, oui. <laughs> just if I just go back to the story of the birds. So, what you're saying is that competition leads to less competition because exactly. of diversification. And exactly. Not immediately, but on in the scale yeah, of the evolution. Okay. Exactly. But then, as you said, if conditions change, you could again decrease the population and then... Uh, uh, yes, and the conditions are always changing. Yeah. So, the good solution at the moment, uh, the good solution, the good allocation of energy, uh, specialization and so on at the moment, is not the good one after. So we have a constant change of the condition and a constant change of the good answer of the organisms to the conditions. And this is a, there is a sort of race between environment and living organisms. And as we are in a system, I will show that after, if you have a change somewhere, a change of one organism, there is an impact on the other organisms. So the other organisms, through the mechanism of evolution, will change also. But if they change, the other one will change also. So you have constant interaction, constant change between organisms, because they are m all linked uh, to the others. OK? Well, so this is the reason why, uh, in the definition of the convention of biodiversity, there is the word variability. There is variability between the organisms, but there is also variability in time. Living, or living world is changing every day, more or less. Okay? Alors, yes, there is a competition, okay? But there is not only the competition, so I will, uh, I'm going to tell you a, a very beautiful uh, story. Richard Darwin, once more. <laughs> uh, and in this case, it is uh, the impact of cooperation on the characteristics of species. Uh, in fact, uh, now in the science of ecology, we have more and more examples of incredible mechanisms of cooperation between organisms. So 20 or 30 years ago, when you make ecology, you speak of competition, mainly. Now we speak of competition and cooperation. And we have examples where two organisms are in the same time 
in competition and in cooperation. There is no, no position between both processes. So this example with Charles Darwin. On the presentation, you have a photograph, a photography of the orchid a plant that was observed by Darwin in Madagascar. And if you look at this plant, you can see some special organs. You see these tubes. These tubes are a common organ in many uh, f flowers. These tubes are nectary. Nectary is the organ where the plant produces sugar, nectar. You know that. And this nectar is the food for different types of organisms, especially, especially some butterflies. So this plant produces nectar. OK, it's normal. But this nectar is at the end of this tube between 20 and 30 centimeters. We have this tube of 20 to 30 centimeters. And the nectar is at the end of this tube. It's not very easy to, <laughs> to, to reach uh, this nectar. So Darwin said there is somewhere, probably a butterfly, with a very long trump, able to go at the end of this tube in order to uptake the sugar. He said it, it must exist. But he has never seen this butterfly. It was a prediction. And in the name of this butterfly, there is the word predicta. It was an organism. Well, there, there was no discussion. It really exists. It exists. It is an obligation. And 20, uh, 15 years later, another naturalist could observe this famous butterfly with this long trump. You can see this very long trump. And this butterfly is able to obtake the sugar at the end of the tube. So we have a very close relationship between the plant and the butterfly. And it is very efficient because this sugar cannot be obtained if you have not a trump, a very long trump. And only this butterfly has this trump. So he's sure to have no competition in terms of food. And on the other side, the plant is very happy because, of course, when the butterfly goes on the flower, some grain of pollen goes on the butterfly, and the butterfly goes only on individuals of the same species, because he has no interest to go elsewhere, because with this trump, it will be very complicated to obtain the sugar. So in terms of the dispersion of the plant, it is very efficient. The success is 100%. And for the butterfly, we have no competition for the food. So we have a win-win system, a very efficient win-win system. But of course, this efficiency, this efficient, efficiency, je crois, uh, well, there is a price to this efficiency. Because if we imagine that the butterfly disappears or the orchid disappears, there is no alternative solution. So in this case, the two organisms will disappear. So there is a very high efficiency, an immediate e efficiency. But there is a big risk of common uh, uh, extension if there is a problem for one of the species. You see? So once more, you have a sort of compromise. And we clearly see that the characteristics of these two organisms are very closely related. We know now with molecular biology that it was a progressive process. At the beginning, the tube was one centimeter. After that, it was two centimeters, and so on. And maybe in the future, <laughs> it will be 40 or more centimeters. Of course, this will stop somewhere. Because at the moment, 
the size of the trunk of the butterfly will not be, uh, it, it will not be possible for physical reasons, of course. So maybe we are in an example of, um, I don't know how to say in English, um, if we continue this process, and it is a, an automatic process, okay, we could have a catastrophe at the end of this process. Il y avait une vraie question Non Ah Merci. So, is it uh, clear Ok Bon. Uh, it is not the common case. Hein? Okay. I have a question. In this case, um, this type of butterfly, is there a competition between other butterflies to get to the speed of the uh, there is a competition to, to have access to, to sugar, but not in this case because. Uh, so they are only attached to each other, there's like a no certain, certain species. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Voilà. Alors, oh, pff, oui, alors, this cooperation between organisms, we have many, many examples. For example, if you look at the microbial <coughs> world, we have uh, the fungi. A real fungi is in fact a network of what we call a mycelium. Huh? The, the fungi we can see in the forest is just the uh, reproductive part of the fungi. The tree fungi is what you, you can see on the, on the photo. And this fungi is closely associated with roots of a plant. In fact, when we go to school, uh, people say uh, that plants uh, feed with their roots. It's wrong. In fact, they feed through the fungi that, associated, that are associated to their roots. Okay? And so, in fact, what happens? We have different types of fungi. They explore the soil, they uptake the resources, and they give the resources, nitrogen, water, and so on, to the plant. And what do the plant in exchange? The plant is a photosynthetic organism. She is a it is able to produce some uh, organic compounds through photosynthesis, and these organic compounds are given to the fungi, and in this case, the fungi can develop and can grow. Okay? So there is a very balanced uh, exchange between this fungi and the roots of many plants, especially of trees. And what is absolutely incredible this last year, some experiments have shown that you take one tree, another tree, for example, a broadleaf tree and a conifer tree, very different species. You can connect them with this network of fungi. It's easy to do in controlled conditions. You put one of the trees in the shadow the other in the light, and you can see that the tree that is in the light transfer photosynthetic carbon to the tree that is in the shadow. And probably, it is not demonstrated yet, probably the tree that is in the shadow transfer nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on to the tree that is in the light. And so in this condition, with this exchange, the ratio between carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, is optimal for the two organisms. And so we are once more in a win-win situation. And so at the same time, we, you have this cooperation in terms of carbon, nitrogen, and so on. But you can have a competition for the access of light, by, for example, in a forest. And so what we know now is that during the development of a, of a forest, the intensity of this network of uh, fungi is increased. There is more and more fungi, more and more connection between trees, including trees of different species. And so probably uh, this will give some new approach of forest management, because at the moment we ignore this transfer of uh, energy and so on between trees. And when you cut a tree somewhere, maybe you cut this network of transfer, and, and in fact, you decrease the growth rate, the performance rate of the forest. 
This is the reason why we explain now that if we can avoid to cut everything on a big area, it's better because in this case we can preserve, preserve some interaction through uh, the fungi. Okay. So this is, uh, this is a perspective uh, of um, change of the forest management in the close future, I hope. I was wondering, because I've heard that like, uh, when you chop down an old forest, and even if you replant the same trees, it never has the same level, like levels of the forest. It never regrows. Uh, it's a question of time. If you wait enough, mm. probably you will rebuild all this network of... Uh, but do you think the fungi is why we have this effect? Because even the trees might grow, you don't get the same... I don't know. If you have not uh, the fungi, you, you have a lower growth rate and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go in. I yeah. just have a comment about that because um, I was working with some tribes in the Philippines and um, there is one tribe that kind of regrew their, for their forest, like a seven kilometer. But what they did was um, they, they know that there's a sort of ancestor uh, wow. tree and it lets <coughs> the other ones grow. So it's like they, they kind of prioritize that tree and then they had like a certain order of which trees to put first and which to put next to each other. And, and it was really interesting because they understood the relationships of the different right. uh, but in fact, you organisms. Because they knew which ones would bring certain animals right. that would help pollinate. So it's really amazing. Many people in, in traditional societies, I don't know exactly what it means, but uh, you see what I, what I mean. They have this type of, uh, of knowledge. It's empirical, of course. But I know several examples of agronomic practice, for example, in West Africa. Uh, when we look at that, we see that people, in fact, they copy some mechanisms of organization we have identified as scientists in terms of productivity, stability, and so on. Because, in fact, by an empirical approach, you make different essays. Some are successful, others are not. And so finally, you do the exactly the same work than evolution. Evolution, do that. Evolution, we have some different essays. A lot of them are not successful. Sometimes one is successful, and it is retained by uh, the evolutionary process because it gives an advantage mm -hmm. to the organism. It's a question of time. And very often, we, we explain that when we, we do a research, with the type of funding we have today, during three, three, three years or four years, we have to compare that with some traditional knowledge accumulated over centuries. Well, look sometimes, and some persons are, are doing that, an observation of what is done by traditional people through the view of the most recent, recent science is very, very interesting, powerful, and gives uh, some information. We can save time. We can we can understand more, etc., etc. So, what is an ecosystem? <laughs> Different organisms in competition, in cooperation, etc., etc. And so, you have this representation. This is a complex system. This is a real world, real world, which fatigue <laughs> of ecology. Uh, and so my job, I am supposed, with the job I do, to understand that and to make prediction of the change of the ecosystem. Well, it's quite impossible, of course, but sometimes we are successful. You will see that. But in fact, the key message here is that through this network of interaction, any change somewhere could have some consequences on many other component processes, etc. It's the case of parasitism. Yeah. Is it neither cooperation nor No, uh, you are absolutely right, and we know, uh, I have no example in my, uh, I have no examples, but we know some cases where cooperation has derived into parasitism, parasitism or the reverse. So the distinction between both is not so clear. You are absolutely right. And of course, uh, a parasite attack the host, and the host defend against the parasite. 
And so there is an adaptation of the parasite that it's uh, infinite yeah, war. Normally, no. No, it, it should be stupid in terms of uh, evolution. <laughs> Uh, maybe for, for some parasites, uh, we suspect that some parasites uh, are a part of the host as an organ, more or less. Uh, as you know, now we, we know that with uh, our digestive system, it's more or less the same. At the origin, the, this is an invasion of a foreign organism. And now it's a part of us. Yeah. So is a complex system more fragile or uh, not so complex? Because like, if you have a complex system, on the one hand, you could argue, okay, if some species extinct, then you have like you can just other ways to. On the other hand, you can also say if everything is connected, and then one misses out, then the whole well, collapse. Absolutely, uh, this is uh, people modeling this type of systems. Uh, th there are two types of models. In fact, some of the models show that if you have a complex system, in fact you have a sort of um, buffer effect. So you, m more complex, more buffering effect, so you don't uh, uh, spread uh, the change. And some other models show the contrary. If you are a complex system, you have many ways to, to, to spread uh, the change. Well, mm. It is not clear, and maybe uh, both uh, mechanisms are possible. It depends once more of the context and so on. But really on the, this is an open question uh, at the moment. Uh, but nevertheless, we have now some general knowledge. Uh, I am going to show you uh, one or two examples. Uh, we wait the results of the modelers, of course, but we have nevertheless some results that can be applied in the management of, uh, of environment. So voilà, this is uh, the problem. Alors, uh, we have uh, another, so complexity, something quite uh, easy to, to understand is what we call the trophic cascade. Uh, and this example is in a lake and it's something classical, demonstrated, it is well known, so there is no problem with that. So we take a trophic chain, uh, a food chain, you see uh, plant plankton, uh, phytoplankton, phytoplankton, phytoplankton uh, some plants with photosynthesis. After that, you have animal plankton, zooplankton. Some fish able to eat this animal plankton and big fish eating the small fish. Okay. And we are in a lake. And we can make some experiments with three different systems. One with only the phyto and zooplankton, two levels uh, of the trophic uh, chain. Another one with three levels, the uh, phyto, zooplankton, and the fish. And the last with four levels, with a super predator eating uh, the other fish. Okay? And so we look at the amount of phytoplankton. Why? Because phytoplankton is involved in the process of eutrophication. Probably you know that. This proliferation of plankton, of algae on the, uh, on the coast, uh, the, the sea coast, due to the supply of nitrogen in phosphorus, due to pollution by nitrogen in phosphorus. We have a prolifer proliferation of green plants uh, able to, to make photosynthesis. So the question is, how can we control this eutrophication of the lake, this rapid growth of phytoplankton. Because if you have a rapid growth of phytoplankton, you have a huge amount of plants. After 10 days, because the lifespan of, of plankton is very short, after that, many plankton are dying. They go in, the, in deep waters. In deep waters, there is a decomposition. Decomposition means, means the consumption of oxygen. So you create a layer of water without oxygen, the fish die, and so on. Okay. So we try to control that. And there are some ecological solutions. So if I have two trophic levels, 
Of course, bah, more zooplankton means less phytoplankton, normal. If I have three levels, I have a big increase of phytoplankton. Why? Because the fish eat the zooplankton, there is less zooplankton, and so the phytoplankton can develop more. And you have, in this case, a risk of trophication, of proliferation of phytoplankton. And if you add, if you add a super predator eating a big fish, eating the small fish, you have a decrease in the mass of phytoplankton because big fish decrease the number of small fish, the decrease of num in the number of small fish decrease, increase the number of zooplankton, and the number of zooplankton decrease the number of phytoplankton. So we have some cascading effect. You change something somewhere, and in fact, you change all the system. And so just an advice now to people uh, fighting against eutrophication in lakes, a uh, very old problem, very classical problem, one solution is to control the composition in terms of biodiversity of species of the fish component of the lake. You can avoid this eutrophication, including in a situation where you have a big load of nitrogen and phosphorus, if you, for example, uh, put a super predator able to control, to control the small fish. I'm not sure if we're, like, there is this argument that if sharks are dying out and ah. they are not eating the tuna, then you will have too much tuna eating the fish they eat, this is and the then until they are extinct, and then the tuna will uh, collapse. But what I'm wondering is, like, who controls the shark? Like, why is this argument ah. f able? Like, ah. you know the argument? Well, yeah, I, I see. So, sorry, fine. Super predators, in fact, uh, at the end of the, of the chain, bah, they are super predators. They are the end of the chain. There is nothing above. And so in this case, the regulation of the super predators uh, is made by the availability of resources and the competition between the different sharks, in, in this case, uh, for the access to well. But why does not a tuna get a new super predator if the sharks don't exist anymore? Uh, oui, it's possible. I don't know. It's possible. Because in fact, super predators are able to, uh, I will give you uh, just an example, in marine systems, they are able to change the prey. There is a problem with prey. So mm, maybe it's possible for, for, I don't know. But just, just a moment. Ah, non. Well, there are some examples uh, in, uh, in marine ecosystems of the same type. Uh, this is another example in Serengeti, in a savanna system in uh, in South Africa, we are in a savanna, you have grass, you have trees, and you have herbivores, you have gnus. Les gnus, les, comment on dit ça en anglais Je ne sais plus. Ce pas des gnus. Wild beast. Wild beast, oui, excuse me, des gnus, n'importe quoi. <laughs> so you have wild beast as herbivores, grasses and trees. So in the 60s, we had a low number of wild beasts because of a uh, bovine uh, pest uh, that was uh, introduced by uh, domestic cows uh, in the system. So one day we could find uh, something against this pest and we could see the number of wild beasts increase. This is on the, on the left of the, of the figure. And as you can see, we uh, could reach rapidly a situation of equilibrium between the number of wild beasts and the ecosystem. Uh, this is the capacity of the ecosystem to support a certain number of wild beasts. So, okay, we have more herbivores in this system. So <laughs> we have more herbivores, so they eat more grass. So you have less, the average amount of grass on the soil is lower. And in this system, there is a fire. These systems are burned 
every year. It's normal. The savannah must be burnt. It's a natural process. Okay. So if you have less grasses, that means less fuel. The intensity of the fire is lower. Okay. This is why what you can see on the left, in the bottom of the of the uh, figure. The area burnt are lower, the intensity of the fire is lower. Now, if you look at the trees, of course, at the beginning, a tree is small. It is in the, in the grass layer. With the fire, the tree is destroyed. If you reduce uh, the spread of the fire and the, the intensity of the fire, of course, you have a better survival of the young trees. And so you increase the density of the tree cover. Your savanna is changing in terms of balance between grasses and trees. And finally, if you make a calculation of the amount of carbon stored in the system, taking into account the trees, the grasses, and the soil, after, I don't know, 10 or 20 or 30 years, you have a very strong increase of the amount of carbon in the system. So finally, the amount of carbon in the system and the ability of the system to sequester carbon. For example, for in relation with climate change and so on, depends on the number of herbivores. And the number of herbivores depends of a, uh, a virus or a bacteria or something, of a disease. Okay. So the disease becomes a key for controlling the amount of carbon sequestration in the system. So we have, in this case, a direct impact of the living organisms on the physical and chemical quality of the environment. And so this is also a key point. Living organisms respond to environment. But living organisms, in many cases, also change this non-living organism, in a non-living uh, environment. OK? Uh, for example, very often people say, well, explain to me if this soil, is this soil fertile or not? If you don't tell me what is the plant in this soil, I am not able to give an answer. Because as soon as you have the plant in the soil, the plant is changing the chemical characteristics of the soil. And if you go in some extreme environment, desert or some savannas, in fact, you see that the soil has no impact on the vegetation dynamics because the plants produce a small environment under their control and they develop in this small environment. Okay? So in this case, this part of the environment controlled by the plant could be said to be called fertile. But if at, at 20 centimeters from the plant, there is nothing in the soil. It is not fertile. So in fact, a part of the fertility, not everything, of course, but a part of the fertility is directly under the control of the plant. And this is the reason why we can use some uh, plant uh, to restore systems, uh, etc. For example, in South America, after you destroy the forest, you make some culture in the soil. Very rapidly, after four or five years, sometimes more rapidly, the production decreases because the soil is completely empty. And the way to restore the fertility of soil is to introduce some grasses coming from Africa <laughs> in order to restore some process to, uh, uh, to begin to accumulate organic matter, etc., etc. Uh, if you could cut the forest in Amazonia, of course, it, uh, it's awful for biodiversity, but it is also awful for the potential of productivity of the system because the nutrient cycle, nitrogen especially, is under the control of the trees. If you suppress the trees, you suppress the system of recycling of nutrients. So you have just what is enfin, the soil as it is. That means sand. And in sand, there is no reserves, there is no resources. And rapidly, the system uh, collapses. And so if you want to restore the system, you have to put again vegetation in order to, to restart the process. 
So, as I said before, we are, we are in a complex system with everything and everywhere, so we don't understand the thing, okay? No, we begin to understand something. <laughs> Uh, 30 years ago, people wanted to know the relationship between biodiversity and productivity. And in this case, biodiversity was just the number of species. So in the US, they made a very big experiment in which they manipulated the number of species, of grass species. So they, they had a pool of seeds and uh, there was a random sampling for five species, 10, 15, and so on. And then, so they created these experimental plots and they measured productivity. And the result is very clear. You have a positive link between the number of species and the productivity. More, more species means more productivity. Uh, of course, yeah. What is productivity? What is? Productivity. Ah, productivity is the amount of plant material produced each year, for, each year, for example. So the amount of grass. The amount of grass, yeah. Okay. yeah. And if you look at uh, this uh, figure, you see that at the beginning, we can make a demonstration. You see, biodiversity is very good because we have more diversity and more productivity. But after that, you see that if you add more species, the effect is very low. So people say, OK, biodiversity is important, but finally, if I lose some species, there is no effect. There is too much species. So how can we answer to that? <laughs> Alors, if you look also at the capacity of the system to maintain the plant production uh, in the context of dryness period, for example, but in fact, you have more or less the same effect. If you increase the number of species, you increase the ability of the system to resist to, uh, to dryness. So this experiment was made different years, and we have more or less the same result each year. So now if you look at the details of the production, the first year, for example, the species A is going to produce 30% of the total amount of grass matter. But the second year, this Species A will produce only 3 or 4%. But another species will produce, the species B will produce, uh, I don't know, 40% of the total amount of the production. So in fact, this is the, the interest of biodiversity. If one year for a reason or another, a virus, a cold winter, uh, I don't know, if you have the decrease of a species, Another one can compensate, and it is very easy to compensate because the competition between the two species is reduced, of course, because the first one is at a very low level of production. So uh, we have in the biodiversity science what we call the hypothesis of insurance. Increasing the biodiversity in terms of number of species give an a sort of insurance for, uh, to maintain the production at a more or less constant level. Okay? And probably, but we have less results on that, this is the same situation, the same impact of genetic diversity, of course. So what is key is diversity in itself. Diversity through different species, or through different genotypes within the species. Okay? So now it's a general rule. Some meta-analysis published now more than five years show with a huge number of experiments that yes, in grasslands, we have in 99.99% 99 of the cases a positive relation between productivity and the number of species. And in most cases, not all, we have also a positive relationship between the number of species and uh, the uh, resistance, particularly to dryness. Okay. So now you can say, yes, we have a low 
as other sciences, we know that there is this positive link between biodiversity, production. It's a general phenomenon. So if you ask me, well, uh, what can I do to increase my uh, amount of carbon in the soil? Is, is this a species a good one or not? Very often I am not able to give an answer. But what I can say is that if you increase the number of species, you will probably have, very probably, have a good result in terms of productivity. So, of course, we would like to have the same result for forest. At the moment, we have not yet. I was just wondering, because at the introductory session, you said that biodiversity is not just increasing the number of species. No, no. It's genetic. Genetic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
definitive scientific conclusion, but we have many observations. Voilà. But once more, uh, even in grassland, it is not impossible to have some negative relationship between production and, and uh, number of species in some particular conditions, uh, of course. Yes, it can happen. In California, there is an ongoing debate because they are they control um, horse populations and wild stock populations, but they kind of con they mix up the numbers for livestock and horses. Yeah. So now the grasslands are kind of growing wild, so they are finding correlations with wildfires yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, over. But in fact. Once more, it's a question of evolution because grasses have had an evolution with grazers, with herbivores. And so we have some experiments showing that at a certain level of herbivory, it is positive for the grass in terms of production, but also in terms of fitness. That means the characteristic leading to a long term uh, dynamic of the species. If you have too much herbivory, of course, it's a catastrophe. But there is a sort of balance of equilibrium between the intensity of herbivory and the health, finally, of the grassland, because grasses have co-evolved co -evolved with uh, herbivores. In a sense, grasses need herbivores, but not too much. Well, it's not pareil. So what are the mechanisms behind? The first one is what we call the sampling effect. It's very easy to understand. If you have a big number, a high number of species, you have more chance to have one adapted to dryness. For example, one species with deep root able to uptake water in deep soil. So if you have 15 species, you have three more times to have this, this species than if you have five. This is what we call <coughs> the sampling effect. Yeah. Why does it even matter whether we have more productivity uh, in the ecosystem of more species when, for example, we want to produce wheat and we don't care about any other productivity except the one of wheat? Yeah. And um, then, then I think like for the agriculture, because I, 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 what I hear or what I think is that you're implying that with like more species we would have more productivity, even like for example in agriculture. Mm -hmm. But then in agriculture uh, we don't care about the like uh, complete general amount of carbon or like dynamics yeah, yeah, yeah. produced. But uh, what the question is that we don't care. Voilà. Uh, so we have to care. So that means that we have uh, we need to organize some ecosystem services payment. We have to make diversity in the landscape. We have to make diversity in the crop itself with a mix of variety, for example, uh, etc. But why would you want to maximize productivity of an ecosystem? Could you repeat? What? Why, why would we even care about ah. maximizing productivity wait, wait. in an ecosystem? The objective is not to maximize productivity. Because when you maximize productivity, you maximize productivity of one crop. That means you have a single view. Uh, I don't know how to say that in English. It is not uh, a systemic view. So if you do that, you can do that. We have done that in agriculture. But since we are in this complex system with many interactions in all the sides, so you have some side effects that are not very positive for you. And for me, the, the agriculture is a good example of the result of the lack of systemic view. If you lack of systemic view, you can maximize one function, for example, the production of, of grain, but you forget everything else. And so probably you will have some problems. For example, in an in a intensive crop field, the rules that are followed by the bacteria are, are the same than in a primitive forest. But we forgot that. So we have now some problems. But so the, max, the maximum productivity is not a, an objective in itself. But it can be. It was an objective. So now what we can to promote, if we try to promote, is a more uh, diverse view. 
And this is the reason why, once more, if we are able to pay for ecosystem services like diversification of landscape, diversification of ecotypes, uh, diversification, enfin, carbon sequestration, and so on, maybe we can promote that. Yeah, thank, thank you. I yeah, I, I, I get it. I'll now, I'm just thinking why we are then talking about productivity, and then I think that a good concept is resist resilience, right? Mm -hmm. Resilience of the ecosystem that you also mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Before. Oui, oui. Uh, if you imagine, um, uh, if we are in a Including in a, in a farm, for example, uh, what is important for a farm is to decrease the variability in order to have a better security in terms of revenue, for example. And so if you increase, you can increase the resilience of the system even if you decrease uh, partly the productivity, but where, what you lose with productivity, you win with stability of production. Once more, it's a problem of compromise of trade-off. You cannot have, it's impossible to have a very high productivity with a very high resilience and so on. No, it's not possible. But we don't see that. Yeah. When we're talking about increasing the biodiversity, are we, in this scenario, talking about doing it in only in agriculture and crop fields? Or are we also talking about doing it everywhere in all fields that need it? Because it, every time we were talking crops or different seeds that could increase the biodiversity, then it would make it more resilient. So which argument stands for, like, which argument would be more for agriculture and which would be more for just preserving forests? Uh, I'm not sure to catch you, but um, uh, I, I think the interest of biodiversity in terms of resilience is valid probably in many uh, human activities, forestry, as you said, agriculture, of course, but also all the question of uh, greening of cities, for example. When you sp discuss with people uh, uh, in charge of the greening of cities, they begin to know the advantage of mixing species, they begin, but they completely ignore at the moment the interest of uh, genetic diversity, for example. And the genetic diversity, especially in the context of climate change, is a key point if we want to have some uh, resilience in the uh, urban trees, uh, for example. But I'm not sure to, to well, answer correctly. The last class, when we were discussing um, what we can do with what we know right now for climate change and how the weather is going to be changing and everything, we were also discussing at one point that maybe we should start planting trees that are now in the south of France and the north of France because the north of France would have a different yeah, yeah, yeah. climate in a while from now. But then the argument was that also planting trees or planting something that wasn't traditionally there is going to maybe impact the ecosystem in a different way, which might not necessarily be better. So Absolutely. Then, apropos that argument, if we now increase the biodiversity by planting things that weren't necessarily there before, to increase the yeah, resilience, yeah, yeah. are we actually increasing the resilience? That's my question. <laughs> uh, but and if so, is it just in... I don't know. Or what I know <laughs> is that probably you will increase the resilience if you increase the diversity. Uh, once more, there, there is two ways to increase the diversity. To mix different species, including species coming from Spain or Morocco, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, for for forests now. Or increasing the genetic diversity. As you said, if you put now, I don't know, uh, a tree from Spain in a forest in France at the moment, you put uh, a tree that has not evolved in the ecosystem. So you don't know exactly what you do. So this is the reason why we, we try to explain that in the, you have a sort of uh, mid-strategy uh, that is to not to, to, to replace oaks by, I don't know, uh, a tree from Spain, but you grow some oaks with seeds coming from the south of the area of the distribution of the, of the oak. You see what I mean? Because in this case, you have not a drastic change of the system, but you put genetic information that is already adapted to the future climate. It could be an intermediary strategy waiting more research about the effect of 
introducing new species in the system today. And really, uh, when you introduce a new species, you can introduce some base and so on. And it's uh, not easy to do. So, from a theoretical point of view, we can focus on the <laughs> genetic diversity once more. We take some seeds coming from the south and stop there at the moment. We, and we make experiments, of course, on the introduction of new species. But it's very complicated because, in fact, the market is not organized for that. When we discuss of that with people in the city of Paris, for example, they say, yes, we know that we have to increase the genetic diversity, but nobody is able to produce uh, some plants coming from the south of Spain, or I have to go to Spain to, to buy the tree. So the market is not organized for that because people don't know that in diversity there is genetic diversity. The key point is the diversity, whatever the, the level. Alors, maybe I am too long, no? If you are tired, you, you tell me, hein, je ne sais pas quelle heure. 18h30, c'est ça, normalement uh, Alors, another, bon, so I said there, there is a sampling effect, hein, but there is also something more, that is the complementarity and uh, facilitation effect. Uh, well, it is well known that if in a grass cover, if you have a legume fixing nitrogen, you will help the other plants to, uh, to have a better nutrition in terms of nitrogen. Some plants need shadow. If you create shadow with one or two species, you allow some other species that adapted to shadow to grow and so on. So this is what we, uh, another class of mechanisms. And the last type of mechanism, but very poorly uh, documented at, uh, at the moment, is this network of interaction between different species through, for example, uh, fungi. Okay? Alors, in forest, very, very good food. Uh, this is a study in the US, huh, if you remember. What is the link between the diversity of pests, different types of pests, and the diversity of trees? You see that under 35 trees, we increase the diversity of pests, and it's normal because some pests are linked to one or two species of trees, so if you increase the number of species of trees, you increase the number of species of pests. But above 35 species, you see that we have a, re a negative relationship. We decrease the biodiversity of pests. Why? Because, of course, if you have a, a big number of three species, the distance between two individuals of the same three species is larger and larger. And this is very complicated for the pest to jump from a tree to another. It's very simple. It is an effect, a direct effect, a physical effect on the dispersion of the pest. And we have the same in agriculture, justement. Rice production in China. There is a variety uh, that is sensible, susceptible, pardon, susceptible to a pest, a fungi. And there is another one resistant to this fungi. So the theory tells you mix completely the two varieties, and you will, you will have a reduction in terms of uh, development of the pest. But of course, it is not always possible to mix some varieties, because, for example, uh, the height of the different varieties is not the same, etc. So it will be complicated for the mechanical management of the rice. So in this case, you create some space heterogeneity, you create some rank of the variety susceptible, and sometimes you put a rank of the variety resistant to the pest, and in this case, once more, <laughs> when the pest arrives on the rank resistant to the pest, you have to jump over this rank. So just for that, you have more or less a decrease of 90% something like that in terms of pest uh, uh, spreading and product, you have an increase in productivity 
of the rice susceptible to the pest. And we have some works at the moment in France, for example, about wheat. And we have more or less the same result. If you increase the variety, you mix the variety, you have some better result in terms of pest dynamic. And of course, in this case, you can decrease uh, the phytosanit, uh, the, the, the use of pesticides. Uh, there was a use of pesticide four uh, times a year, and now there is only one treatment each year. And so you save money because you buy less pesticide. And finally, it's beneficial. This is a system in China, in uh, the Yunnan province, uh, for at least uh, 20 years or something like that. Like the government assign any oui. consultant of biodiversity to each. Of course. Uh, once more, if you, like, if you look at the traditional way of uh, crop production, many often uh, what we explain is there. <coughs> we can find it in the practice of people. But the government, for example, in France, it was very clear. After the Second World War, they decided that the uh, political, uh, the uh, food autonomy was a key point for the political <coughs> independence. Okay. So they decided to produce a lot of food. And also they decided to produce a lot of food at a low price. Because if you have low price for food, you can have salary for people lower. And you win in terms of competitivity between different countries and different industries. So the agriculture was organized for that, and it was successful from this point of view. In France, we have an autonomy in terms of food, and we were very, uh, we export uh, a lot of food. In France. But they forgot, of course, uh, some side effects, uh, because the increased productivity, only productivity, we, we change. Uh, the, the form of plants, for example, we, we change the allocation chain. We try to increase the surface of the leaves to make more photosynthesis. We increase the allocation of energy for the production of grains. But the cost of that was, was well, there was a cost somewhere. The cost, for example, was the decrease of the amount of fruit. If you want more leaves, you have to decrease, decrease root once more because we have this concept of trade-off. But if you decrease roots, the autonomy of the plant in order to find nitrogen, phosphorus, and so on decreases. So you have the obligation to put more and more fertilizer. Voilà. This is a question of political choice, economic choice. Voilà. And now the challenge is to change that because it's also a cultural change. And it is not very easy for many productions, for example, for wheat or cereals, uh, generally. Probably we have to be very productive, intensively productive, because we climate, with climate change, we know that many countries will not be able to produce their, their own food. So the question of international solidarity, especially with cereals, is also a very big problem. If you suppress the cereals crop, uh, the cereals field in France that are very intensive and so on, we win a lot in terms of biodiversity, pollution, and so on. But it is not possible. Uh, it is not possible probably for economical reasons, but also for a question of solidarity in the next uh, future. But other tangible like, side effect of losing The side effect of the loss of uh, losing biodiversity are quite new. Because also there, was a, there is a big change in terms of the view we have 
of the, of the relationship between humankind and nature. And really, uh, this first decade, we, we saw nature, especially the crops, as a machine to produce what, what we want. It was not really living. And this is a key point. Maybe you are a new generation, so probably you think differently. But for, for people from my generation, people who, who were in agronomy school, for example, clearly the plants were machines to produce uh, what we want. So we forgot this natural. But then we thought of the problem of representation of the view we have of the relationship between nature and, and humankind, I think. Boom. Uh, are you tired? Do you want to stop? <laughs> oui, on a besoin d'aller marre. Quelle heure il est? De toute façon, il est l'heure. OK, bon, bah, uh, you will see in the presentation some other aspects, especially urban uh, ecology. But the key message, you understand it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. We can, uh, we can discuss. Bon, bah, it's finished. <laughs>